All right. I'm Clark Haskins. This is Todd Polino. We're from LinkedIn. We're going to be talking to you today about how we use Kafka. Um, so why are you here? You want to figure out what Kafka is all about. Um, you're running Kafka. You're interested to see how you can use it more. Um, and you're looking for some you know, cool things that we've done. So we'll share them with you today. Um, as I mentioned, this is who we are. So we are Kafka Site Reliability Engineers at LinkedIn. So a site reliability engineer, um, it's kind of a Bay Area term. We're the uh, application administrators as well as the uh, architects for how we deploy Kafka, um, as well as developers. We write scripts and tools to uh, make different applications run better. Um, and our number one priority is to keep the site running all the time. So uh, now here's Todd with the overview of Kafka. All right, so we'll start with some of the basics of what Kafka is so we have everyone on the same page. Basically, Kafka, no, not this guy. Kafka is a, a published subscribe messaging system. So in our service, we have a broker. That's what we call a server in Kafka, which is talking to Zookeeper because it stores a lot of its metadata in Zookeeper. And we have a producer that generates messages that are going into our system and a consumer that is reading messages out. Now, all of our data is organized into topics and partitions. So in this case, we have a topic named A and partition zero. And the producer is producing messages into it, and the consumer is reading messages out of it. But we don't want just one. We want two, because now we can handle more data. We can balance it out across more partitions. And our producer is going to send messages. They're going to get stored in Kafka. They're going to get consumed on the other end. But we don't want just one broker. One broker is not good. If that goes over, we're going to have problems. So now we have two, and we've moved our partitions out so they're on two different servers. We get more throughput this way. We can also have resiliency by backing up our partitions. We have in-sync replicas on either side. So now what happens is when one broker drops, the other broker takes over as the leader. Now, at any given time, only one broker can be the leader for any given partition. So at this time, the second broker is the leader for both partitions. When our server comes back up, it's not the leader for anything. Nothing happens to it. No data goes to it whatsoever until something else happens to the cluster. So what is our Kafka cluster? It's disk-based. This is important because we're not keeping everything in memory. We're storing our data long term. It's durable because we have multiple brokers. We can replicate our data across multiple brokers within the cluster. We know that if anything go we drop one broker, everything's going to come back OK. It's also scalable. If we need to support more data within our cluster, more messages per second, all we need to do is add more partitions, add more brokers, spread out the load. We can go as horizontal as we want, pretty much like this room. <laughs> it's also low latency. Messages tend to get published within milliseconds. They're available for the consumers to read whenever they want. Um, we're not talking second latency. We're talking millisecond latency. We're working to reduce that even more. We're looking at ways to go real time on Kafka now. And it has finite retention. So you can set the retention of your data to be in terms of the amount of data you store on the disk. You can set it to be in terms of the number of days that you store data. For example, most of our data in our clusters is stored for a week. So that means once the producer produces the message into Kafka, it sits around in the brokers for a week and can be consumed by as many consumers as want to see it. It doesn't need to be reproduced by, by the producer over and over and over for each consumer. And it's not item potent at this time. You can kind of get there a little bit with using keys and log compression, but it's not quite there. Our developers assure us that this is being worked on and will be solved very shortly. <laughs> so how do we use Kafka at LinkedIn? We have multiple data centers. We have multiple clusters in each data center. We're handling a lot of information. So we're mirroring between all of those clusters. We're taking data from our production tiers. We're aggregating it so that it can be used. We are flowing it to other systems. What kind of data are we talking about? We're talking about metrics on all of our applications, all of our servers. So if we want to know how much disk is being used on a particular server, that information is in Kafka. The metrics flow into Kafka, and then they flow out to a graphing system and an alert system that we use to get all that information. If we want to know what an application response time is, that's in Kafka as well. Every single metric goes into Kafka. We're also doing tracking information. So every time the user takes an action on the website, every single call that happens to build the homepage, all of that information gets flowed into Kafka as well. 
And we're also doing queuing, which is coordination between applications within the data center. So sending out emails, for example, they'll get queued in a Kafka cluster and then pulled off by another application and sent out. So a lot of the tracking information in particular is how we get our data to Hadoop. It comes in from the front end websites, it goes into Kafka, the tracking information all gets flowed to Hadoop, and then it goes back out again via another set of clusters that push it back out to the front end applications that want to know about it. This is how we feed changes into search. This is how we feed changes into recommendation systems. Uh, it's used for almost everything within uh, LinkedIn touches Kafka in one way or another. So really what we're talking about is running Kafka as a service. We don't control the producers that put data into Kafka and we don't control the consumers that pull data out as the SREs. We just run the platform of Kafka. This is opposed to a lot of other installations of Kafka where the people who are running Kafka also control all the data going in and all the data going out. So we've got a lot of unique concerns because of this. How much, are we, how much data are we talking about? We have over 300 Kafka brokers at LinkedIn, uh, and that's actually low because we just deployed four new clusters last week. We have over 18,000 topics in those brokers, and we have over 140,000 partitions worth of data that we're separating everything out into. On an average day, we're doing 220 billion messages into, produced into Kafka, and we're doing about 40 terabytes of data coming in. We have 160 terabytes of data going out. So here's where the log-based retention really comes into play. We don't have to produce as much data as we consume. At peak, we're doing 3.25 million messages per second, give or take. And we're talking about about five and a half gigabytes per second, uh, or gigabits per second of traffic inbound to all the clusters, and about 18 gigabits per second of traffic outbound from all the clusters. So as you can tell, we've got a lot of data flowing through a lot of different systems, and it gives us some fairly unique challenges on a daily basis. All right, so here are the, some of the challenges that uh, we've ran into um, and the solutions. So one of the big things is Kafka is still young. It's still being actively developed. We sit with the, the core team of developers every day, and so one of the things we've been able to do is influence their development to uh, fix our operational problems. The other thing we've done is some operations wizardry to uh, get around the problems until the developers can implement be better solutions. So hypergrowth. So there's more and more data every single day. It's constantly growing. It's never going to get smaller. Um, so you have to be able to expand the clusters to, uh, to keep up. And then more importantly, you have to be able to balance them. So previously uh, with Kafka, before 0.8.1, uh, when you added a new broker to your existing cluster, um, that new broker would just sit there and do nothing until you added a new topic or added new partitions. Um, so with the 081 release, um, one of the cool things that was added was this new feature called uh, partition reassignment. So what that allows us to do is move active partitions onto other brokers, move things around. And so we created a script that allows us to balance the load of the entire cluster. So after we add in new brokers, we can then take and average out you know, the amount of data that should be on every single cluster and then spread it out um, with an optimal number of moves um, to you know, not have drastic impacts on the cluster while that's happening. Um, so one of the other issues that we ran into is, as Todd mentioned, every single application at LinkedIn sends their metrics into Kafka. Well, it turns out they also send their logging data to that same cluster. So logging killed the cluster one day. Someone deployed some, uh, their, some application and it had tons of debug logs. It all went into Kafka and it literally killed it. So one of the cool things we were able to do is build quality of service within Kafka thanks to that partition reassignment tool. So what this is, is we're able to build essentially a cluster within a cluster. So rather than building a new cluster, um, we're able to segregate certain brokers to handle certain types of data. So what we did here is we separated the metrics data, which is our most important data on this cluster, onto its own dedicated brokers. And then um, we're able to then separate things out and essentially do quality of service. Um, the big advantage over creating a new cluster is at LinkedIn, every single application sends their logging and metrics data to Kafka. So we have to change every single instance 
of every single application to get this to work. So the beauty of this solution that we came up with is it's transparent to the users. They have no idea that this actually happened. But our metrics data has now uh, got better service. Uh, we also had some deployment nightmares. So parallel deployments wasn't possible. Uh, so we wound up spending a whole lot of time babysitting sequential deployments. So if you have more than one broker down within your cluster, you're losing data because you're not going to have enough active leaders. Um, that's not acceptable. So what we were able to do is influence uh, the developers to create uh, shutdown hooks. So before any broker shuts down, it checks the health of the rest of the cluster to ensure that everything's up and running as it should before that broker enters the shutdown sequence. Um, so if any brokers have under-replicated partitions, for whatever reason, the, cluster will, the broker will refuse to shut down. Um, let's see, so one of the other issues we ran into was Zookeeper. So with Kafka 08, all the uh, consumer offset information is stored in Zookeeper. So we have 140,000 partitions, I think, and every single one of those has at least one thing that reads from it. And if it periodically updates um, its offset information to Zookeeper, that's 140,000 writes. Zookeeper couldn't scale. So what we were able to do is we put Zookeeper on SSDs. And there's lots of differing arguments on the internet about whether or not that's a good idea or not. We tried it. It worked really well for us. We dropped our uh, average latency of Zookeeper down to zero milliseconds. We thought we broke it. Turns out it was just zero. That's how it was supposed to be. So um, now Todd will talk about monitoring. All right, so one of the big things that we have to do because everyone depends on Kafka is we need to make sure it's up and running all the time. Because no matter what happens, any application that breaks, anything goes wrong within LinkedIn, what do I hear? Kafka's broken. How many of you have little girls? I have little girls. Anyone who has little girls knows that this is Pinkie Pie. Pinkie Pie is always happy. She loves Kafka. Kafka moves all her data around, so why is she so angry all of a sudden? Well, it's because everything's Kafka's fault first. If you have an alert that has Kafka in the title, oh, it must be Kafka's fault, just because you're reading data from Kafka. So most of the time when an application that's using Kafka has a problem, that, especially one that's consuming data from Kafka, it's something called lag. So what's lag? Lag is the difference between where your consumer is in the stream of message data and where the broker is. The difference between the two is the amount of lag that you have. It's how far behind you are reading messages. So this is a consumer problem. Most of the problems are consumer problems unless something about Kafka actually is broken, which it is fairly often. You know, we fix things, we break things, we fix things. That's what we do. So why do consumers lag? Sometimes it's an application problem. Sometimes it's because they have G you know, garbage collection issues and they're, they slow down or they lose their connection to Zookeeper and they've lost their place. Or their processing takes a long time and they're just taking too long to process their data and data stacking up because it's coming in too quickly. It could be a Kafka client problem. So as the Kafka team, so we are the Kafka SREs, we also have the Kafka developers. The Kafka developers are responsible for the client and the producer, the consumer client and the consumer, or the producer client at LinkedIn. So it could be a problem in the Kafka client. There could be a bug that they're running into. It could be a performance problem. In that case, it kind of does become a Kafka problem. It, you know, we need to address that bug and get it fixed. So if everyone's blaming Kafka all the time, how do we get any sleep at night? Because we're the ones that get called at 3 a.m. when something's broken. The biggest thing is educating users. And when we talk about educating users, we're talking about teaching them why lag is their fault. So we go in and we look at their application. We'll take a look at their GC logs. We'll take a look at the errors that they're getting out of their application and try to determine what's going on. We'll look at it. We'll start with looking at our clusters and say, are we healthy? If Kafka is healthy, then let's look at your application. Is your application healthy? Are you running into a bug? Is there something that we can tweak within your configuration to make things run a little better for you? But as part of that, as I said, we have to make sure that we're okay on our side because the first thing we need to be able to say is, no, the Kafka cl cluster is healthy. Or if it's not, there's a problem and we, we need to fix it right now. And generally, we want to know about our problems before our users do. 
So we monitor a lot of things about Kafka. We monitor the Kafka brokers themselves. We monitor Zookeeper. As the Kafka SREs, we're also responsible for all the Zookeeper clusters. We monitor our mirror makers, and I'll get into exactly what those are in just a moment. We monitor our audit infrastructure, which I'll also get into in just a moment. And then we have RESTful interfaces to Kafka as well that are for anyone who doesn't want to use the Java client for some reason, or they can't use the Java client, or they're coming in externally. Uh, and then we also monitor our week over week trending. So we look at what was going on last week and what's going on this week. If we have the same spike in usage every week at the same time, it's probably normal. If we see our, that we're trending up a little bit this week over last week, we have a growth curve and we have to be able to address that and expand things as we get uh, closer to our capacity. So when we're monitoring the Kafka brokers, what are we looking at? If you monitor nothing else, monitor under-replicated partitions. What an under-replicated partition is, is it means that one of the brokers is reporting that it's the leader for a partition and there aren't enough in-sync replicas. So you said you wanted two replicas of any partition and I only see one, the one that I'm running. So there must be a problem somewhere. Under-replicated partitions tells you a lot of information about your cluster. If you have high counts from a lot of your brokers in the cluster at the same time for a long period of time, then you probably have a broker that's offline and you need to address that. If you have a quick spike of under-replicated counts on one or two brokers and then it goes away, well, then you probably just had a spike in your incoming traffic and you might need to adjust how your cluster is laid out, how many partitions you have. You, you probably have some sort of performance issue that you have to address. Another thing we monitor is offline partitions. But as Clark noted, if a partition's offline, that means we're losing data. And that's not an acceptable situation. So if this number is ever anything other than zero, then we have a serious problem. Because that's why we have replication, is so that we don't have, if we do have a problem, we have a little bit of time to take care of it before it actually becomes an offline situation. We monitor the broker partition count. Uh, this is the number of partitions that each broker is managing, whether it's as a replica or as a leader. And we use the scripts like the uh, partition balance tools that Clark talk, talked about to make sure that this is always fairly even, because that keeps our load across the entire cluster to something that is the same on every broker. We can assure that we're fully utilizing our cluster. We also look at the data size on disk because not only do we want to know that we have the same number of partitions, we want to know that they're about equal in size because that determines how much incoming and outgoing network traffic there is on, those, on that particular broker. So we look at our leader partition count as well. As I said, a partition can only have one leader. So this means that for any given partition, only one broker is getting the traffic for that partition, so we want to make sure that each of our brokers has approximately the same number of leaders. Uh, this makes sure, again, that all of our traffic is balanced across the board. And we're also looking at our network utilization. Uh, because we can scale things horizontally, if we start getting up to too much of a percentage of the network interfaces in use, then we can just add another broker, spread out the partitions, get a little bit more leeway before we have to figure out how to use 10 gig partitions on all of our brokers and make the network guys really unhappy when we do that. Zookeeper is the next thing we're monitoring. Primarily, we're monitoring ensemble availability. Zookeeper is a fairly simple beast. Uh, you want to make sure your servers are up, you want to make sure your latency is low, and that's about it. So we want to make sure that all of our servers are online all the time. We generally run five server ensembles in production, which means we can lose two of them before we're going to start to have a serious problem. Um, but like anyone else, if we lose one, then we're all up and taking a look at that and making sure everything's squared away. So the other thing is latency. Uh, this doesn't be, ha hasn't been as much of a problem for us since we went to SSDs because it's really hard to monitor a stream of zeros all the time. But We'll take that bullet. We look at the number of outstanding requests. This is another metric that went to zero when we went to uh, solid state disks. Uh, because of the way Zookeeper processes data, it processes all the requests serially. So one request comes in, that request gets processed, the response gets sent to the client, and then the next request in queue gets processed. If there's a, something that's slowing down requests getting processed, for example, a disk problem, 
that will slow down every request in the queue and we'll start to see that number of outstanding requests build up. That's when you know, we know we start to have an issue. So mirror maker and audit. These are, these are what put our clusters together. This is what makes our, inf our Kafka infrastructure actually be an infrastructure. So in our normal cluster, we have a producer who's producing messages into a single cluster. Then we add a mirror maker because we've got another cluster that we want to move that data to. So the mirror maker sits in the middle. It consumes all of the data from the first cluster and produces it into the second cluster. We use this for things like aggregating all of our data from production. So we have multiple data centers. We aggregate all the, data all the uh, metrics into one cluster so that it can be consumed more easily. So what do we monitor with the mirror maker? We monitor lag. Why do we monitor lag when that's a consumer problem? because our mirror maker is a consumer and we have to be good consumers and we have to do what we're supposed to and keep an eye on our lag. Lag tells us how far behind the mirror maker is copying messages over to the new cluster. So we want that to be low because the larger that number is, the longer it's taking for messages to get from one cluster to the next, the slower our metrics are, the slower our tracking data is. We're also looking at dropped messages. This is another metric where anything other than zero is completely unacceptable to us. If we drop a message, it means we're losing tracking data. It means we're losing metrics. If we're losing tracking data, we're losing money because those are ad clicks. Those are impressions. This is all the data that's getting processed in Hadoop and pushed back out. And if that's not perfect all the time, then we have a serious problem going on. So what else do we have to assure that these pipelines are healthy all the time? We have something called the audit consumer, and this is particular to LinkedIn. This isn't part of open source Kafka. What the audit consumer does is every single producer that is producing messages into Kafka is also producing information about how many messages it produced. So over a 10 minute period, or over one minute period, however it's configured for that particular cluster, the producer will produce another message to a custom topic that says, into topic A, I produced 100 messages. And that flows into the cluster and it flows through the mirror makers as well. We have a special consumer called an audit consumer that reads all of the messages out of the cluster. Everything except that speci those special messages that the producer was putting in. It doesn't care about those, but it cares about every other message in the cluster. And it writes information out into that same special topic that says, over this period of time, I saw 100 messages produced by this producer into this topic. And that all goes into the cluster and it all flows through the mirror maker as well. So what do we monitor about our audit consumers? We monitor lag. They're a consumer, we monitor lag. This should be a recurring topic. Everyone who's a consumer of Kafka should be monitoring their lag to know how far behind they are. And then we have a completeness check as well, which doesn't come from the audit consumer, but it comes from another piece called the audit UI. So the audit UI sits at the lowest layer of our clusters and it consumes all of that audit state and all of those message counts out of Kafka. And it puts all the information together for each tier and it presents a web interface for us and it generates email alerts which say over this period of time there were X number of messages produced into Kafka. At tier one, I saw X number of messages. At tier two, I saw X number of messages. That means our completeness is 100% and we're very happy. If it's ever not 100%, all of a sudden we start getting emails that say which tier is not 100%, how much it's off by. So we monitor this for our producers, we monitor this for each of our cluster tiers, and the Hadoop tier also in emits information about audit and we find out exactly how much data is getting to Hadoop. Because if anything is behind 100%, then we have Hadoop jobs that need to stop running and wait for the data to catch up before we can generate reports for our executives. And if our executives don't get their reports, they get very cranky. And we have to then deal with that. We have to answer why they're not getting their reports every hour. So this is one of the graphs from our audit UI. And you can see over time, it shows how many messages were received. What you can't see is that each of those, that line that's there is actually five different lines that are all exactly the same. Right up to the end, when one of the clusters starts reporting that it's getting fewer messages than the rest. And this was actually a, a problem with, in this case it was the audit consumer itself was not able to read messages fast enough so the audit data was not clean. 
The audit UI also produces another graph, which is how long it takes data to get to each tier. So again, all of the, day, all the numbers are very low, right around uh, 10 or 11 minutes because there's a 10 minute batch time in there. And then all of a sudden, the number gets very high for one tier. And this again shows us that we have a problem with how long it's taking data to flow through our system to that particular tier. And we need to address that. So between Mirror Maker and Audit UI, we have these pipelines that th flow through our infrastructure and make sure that all of our data gets where it's supposed to go. And we know that all of it got there every single time. So the other side of monitoring is now that we know what's going on, we can make it work a little bit better. So what are we tuning? Primarily, we're tuning the hardware and we're tuning the operating system. Kafka itself is a fairly efficient beast. So when we're talking about Kafka, uh, the hardware and the operating system, we start with kernel tuning. There's a lot of kernel tuning you can do. There's, uh, it's kind of a little bit of magic in there as to exactly what you want to touch. For us, the first thing is that we never want to swap. If Kafka swaps, then our latencies go up so high that nobody's getting anything done. So swappiness is set to zero on all of our boxes. Now, obviously, that's a request to the kernel that it not swap. It's not a guarantee that it won't swap. We also run with very, very large uh, servers. So we give Kafka, for example, four gigs of memory to work with. It's running on a 64 gig box, and there's nothing else running on that system with it, primarily because it needs all the page cache for I.O. So we're also looking at our page cache settings. We allow more dirty pages uh, in memory at any given time, but we allow less dirty cache because the cache is more important to us than the pages in memory are. Those can, those can sit a little bit longer. The other big thing that we have to monitor is disk throughput. Uh, as I noted earlier, Kafka is disk-based. All of the data is getting spooled out to disk. Very little is actually sitting in memory. Most of it sits on the disk. So how do we make sure our disk operates properly all the time? You know, the answer, as with most things, is you throw more money at it. We add more spindles. So on all of our servers, we have 14 disks dedicated to Kafka's data running in a RAID 10 configuration, so we get as much throughput out of those as possible. We also use a, larger, a longer commit interval on that particular mount point. Because, uh, because we're replicating our data from broker to broker, we can suffer a data loss on any one broker if it crashes. So whereas the normal commit interval, I believe, is 30 seconds, we're actually running with 120 seconds on that mount point because that means we have to go out to disk less often, provides more efficient operation. Uh, again, if that disk crashes for some reason, the broker goes away, another broker will pick it up. We know that the data is still safe even if that happens. The other side of tuning is the Java virtual machine. So when we're talking about tuning the Java, we're really talking about tuning garbage collection. That's the, the big thing that you have to touch. Now, for most, of the, most people, for most of the time, tuning Java is this dark art. You have to know all the little magic and do all the special little things. And you have to spend weeks and weeks looking at your application to see exactly what it's doing. Yeah, we don't do that anymore. So the first thing we did was we moved to Java 7 update 51 as soon as it was available. Uh, we tried update 21 for a while. Update 21 is OK, but it has some serious bugs in the garbage collection. Why do we go to Java 7 update 51? As I'm sure a lot of you know, you get the garbage first collector. Uh, we've actually very recently turned this on on all of our Kafka instances, and it has performed wonderfully for us. Now, the way garbage first works is it's designed to take the magic out of tuning Java. It's designed to give you fewer dials, fewer knobs to touch, and provide more automation behind figuring out what the garbage collector has to do to hit your targets. Uh, it works very well. So the first thing we do is we set the heap size. We specify a target pause time for our GC. Now, this is the amount of time we'd like most of our GCs to take. In our case, we use 20 milliseconds for Kafka, and it seems to work out pretty well. You don't set the new size anymore. So you don't lock in the sizes of any of your generations because you want the garbage collector itself to manage those for you. If you do set the new size, you override the GC pause time, and you might as well be back tuning uh, Java yourself again. So what did this do for us? It dropped all of our GCs on the Kafka brokers to less than 15 milliseconds per, per full second spent in GC. 
We have steady 20 to 22 second GC intervals all the time. But the most important thing to us is we no longer have any full GC cycles within Kafka brokers. We get them once in a while when we have a load spike and traffic goes up very quickly and then drops off. We'll see one or two GC cycles on one or two brokers and then they'll go away. Those full GCs are only 200 to 400 milliseconds though, so they're actually not a problem for us. So that's uh, pretty much what we do with tuning to make this all work properly. All right, so in closing, 082 is coming out very soon, and there's some cool new features that are coming with that. Uh, one of the big things is the consumer offsets are no longer gonna be stored in Zookeeper. Kafka is gonna store them itself in a specialized topic for offsets. Uh, delete topic. This was kind of there in 081. Didn't work. If you ran it, it killed your cluster. Um, it's going to be fixed in 082. Uh, further down the road, uh, a new producer is coming out with much higher uh, throughput capability, uh, as well as an improved API. Um, upcoming operational work. So we're going to learn to share. So we talked about all these scripts that we've written and things like that, and we're going to delinkedinify them. So what I mean by that is currently they're um, written within the LinkedIn Python stack. We're going to take the LinkedIn part out and open source them. Uh, we're going to write a script for shrinking a cluster. Why would you do that? We're not quite sure yet, but we know how to do it, so we're going to write a tool to do it. Um, then we're also writing a cluster comparison tool. So as Todd showed you, you know, we have lots of clusters all talking to each other. And if you don't have the partition counts for those topics set the same on every single cluster, you'll run into bottlenecks. You know, the, if the first cluster has 64 partitions, next one has eight, well, it just, sometimes it can't keep up. Uh, so we're gonna write a tool to uh, compare the clusters to ensure that everything's the same across your configuration. Uh, we're also gonna work with advanced monitoring. So we wanna be able to check, catch these load spikes as they happen. So if a particular topic or logging event happens, we wanna be able to see who's sending us all this data all at once, and then we can take appropriate actions to uh, to prevent it from killing the cluster. So how can you get involved? Uh, Kafka.apache.org. You can join the mailing list, the users list. Uh, join the IRC channels on Freenode. You can contribute tools if you feel so inclined. You can talk to us. Our information is right here. And questions. How are you managing that amount of clusters? Are you guys using Chef or Puppet to deploy Kafka, or what are you using for the deployment and the configuration? Um, so LinkedIn has its own internal stack for that. That's okay. what we use. Oh, so. okay. um, can I just ask one more question? Security, have you guys had to worry about things it's like encryption coming. at rest and in transmission? It's coming. We're, it's uh, officially? <laughs> we know that we're, as, at LinkedIn, we're gonna be forced to use it very soon, so it will be coming. Okay. So. Yeah, it's, it's something that the, uh, the developers are actively talking about and trying to figure out exactly when it's gonna happen. They were talking about doing it sometime this year. It looks like it may take a little longer than that just because of the complexity. We've been asking, we, you know, our push is for both, as you said, encryption of the data in transit. Uh, you can already have a producer encrypt the data and have the consumer decrypt it, but we actually want full TLS on the entire uh, transmission so that we can have, Right now, if we have someone who's outside of LinkedIn producing data in, they need to produce into one of our REST interfaces and they have to, we have to encrypt it with a VPN tunnel or something else. And then the other thing, obviously, is ACLs on the data itself so that we can assure who's talking to particular things. It's pretty complex. It's definitely something on their roadmap, but we can't say exactly when. Um, you mentioned data segregation for the log and metrics. Yep. What sort of knobs or tweaks or conditions can you do to choose when to segregate or when not to segregate? So essentially, it's all done by the, the topic name. So we ensure that topic, all the partitions for a particular topic exist on those particular brokers. Um, we store that in a key value store, and then we were able to write scripts that periodically check to make sure no new uh, topics were created on those, on those brokers, and then we move them away if they were. Any other questions? 
<laughs> Go for it. Uh, so you've got 18,000 topics, all right? At the moment, we're kind of looking at how to figure out how, how to do topic segregation. So just in terms of your experience, and I know this isn't a generic answer you're gonna give me, but in the, in the LinkedIn um, experience, how did you guys decide how you were gonna segregate things like topics and metrics? Was it purely by scale or was there functional reasons as well? Are you talking about dividing it between clusters? Uh, I, I'm actually talking about, okay, we need a new topic for this. And there, there was some reason behind um, the, the needing of that new topic. And, and generally speaking, what are the reasons behind, okay, we need a new topic for this? Right, so that, I mean, it's pretty much outside of our realm for that stuff because we're essentially running Kafka as a service. So anyone that wants to create a topic can. Um, they just start sending us data and the topic gets created. Um, there's other, you know, things that they have to do to get their, their schema approved and things like that. Um, that we have internal to LinkedIn, but um, we're not really part of that process. Yeah, we do actually, um, for the most part, people break out their topics by the type of data it is. So there's one topic for a page view. There's one topic for an ad click. There's a topic for somebody clicked on a job. Uh, there's, so there's topics for all of these things and they get aggregated at the other end. Uh, as Clark mentioned, we have you know, a review committee that reviews the data models and makes sure that they're consistent. They all contain the same types of data and the same types of fields. Um, but our focus really is running it as a service. We, we don't want to have to care about the data. As, you know, as the guys running Kafka, we don't want to have to care about the data that's going through it. We just want to know the sizes of what it is. Just one final question, sorry, on the, prior to using G1GC, were you guys using CMS or what were you using? Uh, prior, with yeah, director? we were using Parnu and CMS. Okay, all right, that's great, thank you. Anybody else? Thanks. Thank you.